Okay, I think um, we are ready to get started. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming this afternoon. I know it's been a long day and a lot of learning, and I know you are all really tired. I think this presentation should be pretty fun, pretty mellow. Um, there's only one line of code in the whole presentation, so um, hopefully that should be pretty mellow. Um, my name is Mike Wolfson. I'm a Google developer expert in Android. Uh, I work for the Nerdery. We're an um, agency, digital transformation agency in the United States. And then lastly, uh, I'm an author. I wrote um, that book for O'Reilly called Android Developer Tools Essentials. So what I'm going to speak about today is human-centered machine learning. Um, and I wanted to set this up with a um, little bit of a story or an um, explanation. So. Um, the MIT Media Lab in the United States did a study um, on the image classification algorithms that are commonly used in the United States. And they looked at the core data sets that were backing that image classification, those image classification systems. And what they discovered was that the data sets were very biased. Um, in one case, they were 20% non-Caucasian. And in the other case, they were 75% non, uh, or let's say 25% female. So they were extremely biased towards uh, Caucasians and males. Um, and this is a huge problem, and I'm going to explain to you why. OK. Um, what the researchers that were studying this discovered was that in machine learning systems, there's something called bias amplification. And if you have a bad data set that doesn't um, have real-world data in there, what they discovered as is machine learning software that's trained on uh, bad data sets didn't just mirror the biases that existed in those data sets. It actually amplified that bias. Um, and so let's take a look at how that manifested itself in this case. Um, and we can start to learn how some of these things can really be big problems. OK, so when they started to look at how the gender, um, how the image classification systems were performing, they looked at white males. And white males, um, and what they were trying to do is they were trying to classify whether the person in the photograph was male or female. So if you are a white male, the classification algorithms generally got it, your classification correct 99% of the time. And that's really awesome, right? That's super high accuracy, super wonderful. However, if you're a black gentleman, that accuracy rate went down to 88%. Still not terrible, but not great. And this is just because of the color of that gentleman's skin. Now, if you're a female, white female, the accuracy was 93%. Again, you can see how that's pretty good. But what do you think the accuracy was for a black female? Probably not very good. Who said 60%? You're, actu you're absolutely right. 60% of um, black females, only one third of black females were accurately gender typed using uh, this, these image classification systems. And the nature of the problem is because of those poor data sets. The image classification systems weren't trained using good data, so the output is bad. So it's pretty good to get 99% right. However, this 65% for a black female is not OK. Um, we can talk about all sorts of issues that could come up um, based on racial and gender classifications being done incorrectly. There can be all sorts of different challenges. So the message that I want to share in this room and in this session is that designers and developers must actively manage bias when creating machine learning systems. It's not enough to just know about the bias and to try to plan around that. We have to do steps and systems that actively manage that bias to ensure that we're not um, presenting, uh, creating algorithms that don't do what we expect them to do. So uh, Google has created a process called human-centered machine learning. And what this is, uh, it's a system that's created 
by the Google UX department. Um, and this is a uh, set of steps that are designed to help us focus our discussions on how we manage our machine learning systems and help us identify opportunities for bias and manage them. It's grounded in human needs, so just the same sort of needs that we use to determine if our users are being served correctly. We have those same needs in machine learning systems, and we need to make sure that we account for them. And lastly, as I mentioned, this human-centered machine learning set, uh, process is actually a system of seven distinct steps that will help us go through this process. So this isn't something that's kind of, you know, um, loose or doesn't have a really defined process. It has a very distinct set of processes that when you're designing your machine learning systems, you should go through all seven of these steps and then repeat over and over again, just like in an agile process. So we're going to go through these really quick. I'll just read through these. Um, and then we're going to go through each of these steps in detail. Um, and then I should also mention that if you're kind of trying to keep track of where we are in the, in the presentation, um, I'll go through each of these seven steps, so that should give you a pretty good idea of where we are. Okay, uh, I'm, not gonna I'm just going to read through these really fast because I'm going to um, give a lot of uh, explanation about each of these. Uh, the first is don't expect machine learning to figure out uh, what problems to solve. The second is ask yourself if machine learning is going to address your problem in a unique way. Third is fake it. The fourth is understand the p costs of both p false positives and false negatives. Uh, fifth is plan for change and adapt your system over time to account for that. Uh, sixth is teach your system using the right uh, uh, labels. And last is make sure that uh, ML is a, a creative process. Make sure that everybody is involved. OK, so let's go ahead and step into our first um, basic principle of human-centered machine learning. And that is the principle that don't expect machine learning to figure out what problems to solve. So as I mentioned, I work for a digital agency, and we do a lot of sales presentations and a lot of client uh, presentations. Um, all of the clients want to hear the word machine language. Everybody is hot for using machine language in their systems, and they're waiting for us to say, we're going to solve your problem with machine learning. Um, it doesn't make much sense because machine learning isn't a panacea. It's not going to solve all of our problems. It needs to use, be used very wisely and ve in a very sophisticated way. And one way I wanted to illustrate this, um, one of my colleagues, um, when we were talking about human-centered machine learning, she said that machine learning is like a, um, machine language systems are like an asshole genie. So let's talk about what that means. So, you rub a lamp, and out comes the genie, and you're like, hey, genie, I really want a Tesla. Red Tesla, it's so awesome, man. I've wanted one of those forever. And the genie says, you sure? Yes, man, I really want a Tesla. I'm sure. Right? The genie's going to give you a Matchbox car, right? Because he's an asshole. You need to understand, just like with machine learning systems, you need to understand what it is that you're sending into the system and ensure that you're asking the right questions. Machine learning is not some magic box that you throw a bunch of data into and it gives you all the right answers back out. It just doesn't work that way. And as we already met, uh, and uh, so of course, the uh, common uh, mannerism or common saying about this is, Garbage in, garbage out, right? And we just demonstrated how that works, right? We had garbage in of this really biased data set, and what we learned is it gives us garbage out, right? It correctly, it doesn't correctly identify certain genders or um, races. So garbage in, garbage out. Um, so it's important to know um, that um, the tools that we're using for solving our general user case, our general problems in regular operations, are the same things we're going to use in machine learning systems. We still need to understand the human needs in our systems, like, uh, and the way that we do that is we perform user interviews or surveys or analyze logs and support tickets, um, or pretty much any way that you and your system currently analyze your users' needs and your requirements. 
machine learning isn't some magic data box that's going to tell us everything we need. We still need to understand the requirements of our system, understand what it is we're trying to do, and understand how we're creating that uh, system. I feel like I'm talking really fast, so we'll probably be out of here early. <laughs> okay, so moving on to the second bullet, um, you have to ask yourself, will machine learn it? Will um, ML address my problem in a unique way? So you can just ask yourself s some very simple questions to help you understand that. For instance, how would a human solve this problem, right? Analyze how a human would solve this problem, and you start to understand if you're going to actually get any benefit from machine, machine learning systems. Same thing with how uh, an important question to ask is how you would guide a human uh, to solve the particular problem you're trying to solve. Once you start to understand some of these basic needs, you can then start to understand how you would construct a machine learning system to meet those needs. And then lastly, uh, ask yourself, what assumptions would you want a human to make if they were solving these same problems? Because you're going to need to make sure that your machine learning systems are applying those same assumptions or at least accounting for those. Oh, um, of course, then these questions should all lead you to the final question of, does this problem really require machine learning? Am I going to get a benefit from solving this problem using that tool, or is it better solved by using you know, other, other tools? So a way that you can look at um, how to kind of analyze this is you can create something called a confusion matrix. I think you all kind of understand how this works. And basically what you will do is you'll map your requirements and your, uh, the features you're working on across each of these accesses. So um, you want to understand user impact and machine learning impact. And once you've started to map those items, you can quickly see that the items that are in that top bucket that have huge user impact and high impact for machine learning are the features that you should concentrate on, and that will probably benefit from machine learning. The ones you don't want to concentrate are on these ones that are in the low uh, quadrant, right? Those are things that aren't going to benefit much from machine learning and that also aren't going to have a lot of user impact. So you need to think about um, which features you're working on and where they sit within your system uh, to make sure that you're you know, putting your time towards the right um, features. This is, the this is the single line of code I promised you. Perhaps many of your machine learning systems can actually be replaced with a very cleverly figured out select statement. Um, that may actually uh, provide you much better feedback in a much quicker uh, loop than creating machine learning systems which are complicated and take a lot of time to deal with. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to the third um, principle and step in human-centered machine learning, and that's a concept called fake it. So as I mentioned a moment ago, machine learning systems are really complicated to set up. It's not like, you know, like an Android app. When I started create, writing Android, I wrote my own app. I put it in the store. Super easy, super fun. You can't really do that with machine learning systems. They take um, a lot of data to set up. The models take a lot of time to train and function. But what you can do is a process called um, fake it. And w um, what they suggest that you do is, um, the example that uh, the human-centered machine learning uh, gave is they brought some people in to uh, analyze um, how a music suggestion algorithm would work. And so they asked that person to come in with real user data, give us um, a list of, um, of uh, music discs that you like, or maybe even a uh, you know, the disks themselves. And then what they did was they just created a fake UI out of cardboard. And when they, um, they would start to analyze how the um, algorithm might work, whether it might suggest this album or this album, they would just show it to the user and test, you know, how that's working. So before they've set up any machine learning algorithm, they, they've started to check their assumptions, they've started to understand the impact it'll have on the user, and they've started to, you know, validate some of those assumptions. That's way before um, step one of machine learning has been started. You can learn a lot from that. A similar sort of setup um, is something called the Wizard of Oz method. And basically what this is, is you create a user interface um, and you tell the user that they're speaking to a machine learning algorithm on the back end. However, on the back end, you have a real user 
a real person that's simulating what the AI might be doing. So if it's a, you know, a messaging app um, and you're supposed to be, you know, creating um, autocomplete text or responses, there's someone in the back end that's actually just creating those, that's a real human, but you're still testing your assumptions and the user thinks that they're talking to an AI. Again, this allows you to validate a ton of different assumptions about your use case and your um, product before you've invested any of the expensive time and money into creating a machine learning system. Okay, so this is actually, this bullet number four is probably my favorite part of the presentation because it allows me to get a little ranty um, and I can use it to demonstrate uh, some of the kind of problems with machine learning. Um, anyway, so uh, bullet number four is understand the costs of pulse, understand the costs of false positives and false negatives. So as we saw in that last, as we saw in the first example, um, when uh, there's a false, uh, let me just get, step through the examples actually. Okay, so as we um, saw already, um, uh, actually I want to just um, talk for a second what false positive and false negative means. So if we have a reference on the left side and a prediction on the top side, if the reference and the prediction match, like in this case, then that's a true positive, right? We are trying to determine if this is a male, and in this case, it is a male that is a true positive. So that's a great, that's a success in machine learning. Everything is working great. Also good would be a true negative. We are trying to determine if this is a woman or a man, and we determine that it's a woman, so that's a true negative, and that is a correct assumption in our system. Where this starts to fall apart is when we have false negatives or false positives, where that gentleman is not correctly um, gendered as a gentleman or the woman below are not, is not correctly gendered. These two uh, quadrants are the ones where we really need to concentrate on and understand. Um, having false negatives and false positives may actually not be a bad thing in our system and we may actually want that but we really need to understand the cases of both of these and really, um, uh, we really need to understand that and understand the impacts on our systems. So let me um, talk about some of these impacts. So um, this is a example of the um, uh, Google Images, um, and this is also from the human-centered machine learning example. It's just a great one. So this is a case where false positives may be okay. The person um, searched for playgrounds. And in this case, what came up was playgrounds and a schoolyard and um, kids playing where there's no playground. So that actually is probably good, right? We kind of want a lot of false positives because I'd rather see a bunch of images that may be close rather than no images at all. So this is actually good and it's probably what we want, right? We're probably okay with false positives. There's no big impact if, you know, we get a couple extra images, right? Like no, f no harm, no foul. But let's talk about when the uh, false positive could be more problematic, right? And that's the concept of tr you know, pre-crime, where we start to assume that somebody is a criminal based on certain aspects of their character or their gender or their race. And if you think that this is kind of a weird edge case and the future and Blade Runner, it's actually a little closer than you may think, and there's some real scary challenges here. So um, let's dig into that a little bit. Um, so uh, Georgetown Law uh, estimated that in the United States, 117 million uh, Americans are in an image classification database. So in the United States, we have about 300 um, million people in our population. Um, uh, Sweden has about 60,000. So in, that would be like 20,000 Swedish people being an image, in an image classification database. One out of every three people in this room would be uh, in an image classification database. And that's pretty scary because um, that's not something that you kind of opted in for or um, are actively participating in. The important aspect of the American database is that a majority of the images and faces in that database 
are based on mugshots and arrest records. In the United States, that is a predominantly African-American problem. Um, and so that database is super skewed uh, towards uh, bias towards a particular racial makeup. Um, and that's a huge problem. Um, so let's dig into this a little more where a false positive may be okay, um, may not be okay. Um, so the ACLU, which is the American Civil Liberties Union, they're an organization that fights for um, uh, privacy and people's rights. They use the Amazon recognition database to, uh, they use 25 mugshots, um, public mugshots. They use those to identify members of Congress. We have about 300 members of Congress um, so they used this uh, database and they looked at all the members of Congress and it misidentified 25% of the members of Congress, Congress as criminals. And the scary thing is 30, 30, 40% of those misclassifications were people of color. Um, and so that tends to give you a little bit of an indication of some of these things that happen, right? We misidentified 25 of our lawmakers as criminals and also we happen to misgender, uh, misidentify most of the black guys. Um, and that's really not okay on multiple levels. Okay, here's another example. Um, this is a uh, company from Israel called Faceception. Um, and basically what they do is they actually use um, character, uh, physical traits to analyze um, certain characteristics of a person. So it's pretty cool if like I'm getting gender identified as high IQ or an academic researcher or a professional poker player or bingo player. That's pretty low key, right? No problem. I don't really play bingo, but whatever. But let's talk about this. They're actually using that same algorithm to determine if you are a white collar offender, a terrorist, or a pedophile. Now it's not really okay, right? Because hey, I happen to look a lot like that pedophile and I don't appreciate being misgendered as such. Um, this is not a, um, th so uh, also worth mentioning, Faceception sells their databases to law enforcement agencies. That's their primary business. Um, so, and you can't opt into this database. That's not something you can either opt into or opt out of. Um, it's pretty scary actually. Um, and not to get too kind of, uh, crazy or whatever, but this is like, uh, this is basically racial stereotyping and it's really, really scary. It's the kind of stuff that Hitler did. So, sorry, I don't mean to get too crazy about that. Okay, so let's move on. Um, uh, the fifth element and principle of human-centered machine learning is to plan for change and adapt your system over time. With machine learning systems in particular, this isn't a set it and forget it thing. You need to constantly be, um, you need to constantly understand how your system's performing, what your inputs and your outputs are, and you're going to constantly need to change that, right? We don't put software out into the world that we just leave and let die. Um, it's very much the same with machine learning. So some ways that you can um, understand how your system is performing is create some use cases. And um, in the um, use cases, we can start to measure certain things that help us understand our system over time. So things like accuracy or error rate, um, those things can really help us understand if our algorithms are correctly predicting or incorrectly predicting. And a really powerful tool to help us understand if we're having success or not is to use in situ feedback over the entire product cycle. And that's just a fancy word for feedback while the user is doing something. Um, so there's some really nice examples of that where you can provide really easy opportunity for the in-situ feedback, which is really valuable. So you could imagine in a um, language processing system, you could just ask the user really quick, was that a good uh, response? Yes, no. Or um, Google search allows you to also get feedback on their predictions. If you, um, was the prediction appropriate? Did you like it? These sort of in-situ feedbacks give really good feedback at the point of um, classification, which can be really useful for machine learning systems. Okay, um, moving on um, to
to uh, the sixth principle, which is called teacher algorithm using the right labels. So a quick uh, recap on what labels are. So labels are just a way that, peop that uh, machine learning algorithms uh, group data. So we may create, um, we, when we're trying to uh, understand basically like what a hot dog or not hot dog, like in the Silicon Valley example, uh, a person is going to need to go in and identify a bunch of images to start to train our system. This is done by a person. This isn't done by a, a machine, and it can't be. It needs to be done by a real person that understands what they're looking at. Um, so that's labels, and it's really important that when we're using, um, when we are generating the labels for our system, that we're careful to use the uh, proper labels. So let me tell you how we can um, go about um, knowing which labels to use. Um, one thing to mention about labels is when labels are subjective, they're really hard to place. So if we're talking about um, happy, sad, um, the person seems uh, whatever, the person seems happy, the person seems rich, whatever, those things are really hard to understand and to label. When something's not subjective, this is brown, this is a car, this is a tree, they're much easier to understand. So it's really important that when you're trying to create your labels, that you make sure that you're not using subjective terms or subjective uh, labels, because um, you, it will create tons of issues for you over the long term. Um, it's also important to know that models uh, take a lot of time and expense to train. So it's really uh, important to understand your labels when you start to create your systems, because this isn't like something that is done really fast and that's on the fly. It takes a lot of time to train these systems. So if you don't put a lot of thought into the things that you're using to train your systems, you're going to get a lot of garbage and you're going to have to complete the cycles, uh, retraining your models until uh, you get the outputs you expect. Um, and of course, getting this wrong has a huge impact on viability. If you're not thinking through how you're training your system and setting it up in the beginning, over the long term, this could, be, this could doom your product. So a uh, really nice way to ensure that you are generating the proper labels is to create a content specialist in your organization. And this is a domain expert that knows the data that you're working with. Um, they're also able to make assumptions about that data and discuss that with other people in your organization. So they're a consensus gatherer and they're a, um, like a business analyst. They know, really know the system super well. Um, once they have kind of started to, uh, once you have that domain expert, you have them start to create assumptions and then validate those assumptions. And it's interesting, once you start to create these assumptions, you start to create a catalog so that over time, you can understand what the assumptions were that you created for your system and track how you met those over time. Once you've done that, you can fake it. And then uh, after you've done that, you repeat the whole cycle. Um, so let's um, just dig into assumptions just for a second further, and we can start to understand some of the language you might use when you're um, creating an assumption. Um, let's just go to that slide. Okay, so assumptions take this form. They basically say, for these type of users in these situations, we assume they'll prefer this and not that. So that is basically a really clear assumption on what you expect for certain users your system to provide. So what this domain expert will do is they'll create a bunch of assumptions about the system and the expectations that we'll uh, expect out of our system. They'll test those and then they'll create a catalog so that when the next designer comes in or the next developer comes in, they're able to look through this catalog of assumptions and understand um, how we've met those assumptions over time, how we haven't met those assumptions over time, or also how they've changed, right? We may have made an assumption about the user early on in the process, and then by the time we got to the end, we realized, man, we were way off. But being able to track those over time uh, gives us a really good understanding of how our systems have evolved over time. It's particularly important in machine learning systems, which can be difficult to track um, and difficult to kind of understand how things are how things are evolving. Okay, um, 
the number seven bullet uh, is just mentioning that machine learning is a creative process. Make sure that you involve everyone. And I just want to call back to the original slide, which I told you was the main slide in my presentation. Uh, the message is that designers and developers must actively manage their machine learning projects to understand where bias can creep, creep in. OK, so um, I mentioned a bunch of bad stuff about you know all the Hitler stuff and all the race stuff. Um, the truth is, it's not all bad news. Things are getting better. And thanks to some systems like this and some people that are actively um, managing machine learning systems in our world, there's been some great, um, there's been some great advancements and things are, are great. So one thing I wanted to call out is the MIT um, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory has created an algorithm specifically designed to account for uh, bias in data sets. Um, and underrepresented, um, uh, uh, underrepresented data in machine learning algorithms. This is really promising because it allows us to um, account for the bias early on in our system and not have to uh, deal with that bias later when it may be much more difficult to deal with. Another one is IBM Research created a new algorithm for image classification that instead of being based on skin color and other tones, was based on things that are not uh, race specific. Things like uh, measurement, uh, uh, pupillary distance, or uh, head shape, or other things that are um, not tied to race. Um, so they've created this new computer algorithm with one million data set, uh, one million uh, faces annotated with these features. So you may have actually played with the IBM image classification downstairs. Um, unfortunately, this isn't using that new data set I asked. Um, and unfortunately, IBM has not made that data set public yet um, because there have some challenges with the images that are in the data set. They don't know how to make um, the data set public based on the um, people that are in the data set. Um, but it's really promising because, um, and I'll show you um, some, advance, some advances in a moment. Well, let's just go on. Um, so uh, Joy Bualawemini, got it. And I want to get her name right because she's super awesome. Um, she's the woman who created that New York Times study that I referenced earlier about uh, the bias in, in image classification systems. She's also created something called the Algorithmic Justice League, which is um, a organization specifically designed to hunt out bias and hold organizations accountable when they're not meeting minimum requirement needs. So she's the one that wrote that article calling out um, all the different um, image classification algorithms for being, um, uh, for not working right. So as you recall, this was the original results of that image classification where uh, IBM had 30 5% incorrectly gender classified. Um, Face++ had 30% you know, and Microsoft had a 20% um, failure rate. So that's pretty bad and that's with the original study. So um, the Algorithmic Justice League presented a bunch of suggestions to the different organizations and also highlighted all these challenges and the different companies uh, actually implemented a bunch of suggestions from her and got much better. Uh, Microsoft went from a 20% failure rate to a 1% failure rate, um, and that is really worth celebrating um, because they're all applying, um, uh, Face++ went down to 3.6. Um, important to note that there's a new player on the top of that um, incorrect rate, and that's Amazon Recognition. Amazon Recognition, should be called out because they're really terrible and they don't seem to be wanting to address this problem. You can see that all these other um, vendors actually made significant gains. Um, recognition um, uh, has not made those same gains and recognition sells their databases directly to law enforcement. So this is a real problem that we need accuracy in these systems. Um, so I'm calling out Amazon. Okay, and then um, I also wanted to mention two, uh, two other last um, reasons to be optimistic or cool resources that you may want to research. Um, so Google actually also understands that, this, um, that these image data sets are biased and they're actually making big efforts to, uh, to um, 
create less biased data sets. So they created this open, um, they created an inclusive images uh, competition that was designed to drive more inclusive images into that base data set. Um, they haven't always been successful at that. You might remember a few weeks ago that Google got in trouble for paying homeless people $5 to take their picture and not really telling them what they're using it for. Maybe that was just a, a US story. Um, so they haven't always been effective at accomplishing this, but um, the fact that they're uh, making efforts is really important and valuable. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, AI.Google um, is a really great resource where they have released something called the um, People Plus AI Research. Um, and this is a website with a ton of information about all sorts of aspects of how to manage AI and uh, all sorts of different impacts to uh, the world, um, including um, a ton of publications about basically anything you could want to read about machine learning. It's a really valuable data, uh, really ba valuable, um, really ba valuable website. And uh, in particular, the there's a document called the PAIR, and it's um, I think it's a six chapter document that outlines all sorts of really practical steps towards managing data in your in your environments. This isn't just for machine learning. This is for anybody that uses data in their computing. OK, I think I am right on time. Um, I did want to mention that um, th the links where you can read more, and also this is where my research for this presentation came from. Um, so feel free to check that out. Um, the slides are already up at um, that URL, tinycc slash oradev slash HTML. So you're welcome to download those. Um, and then you're welcome to reach out to me on social networks or come find me at the conference. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you so much.